Good morning. Would you please stand and sing with us? Father, we are so thankful and grateful to have you as our God. We are so thankful um, that we are able to worship you and come together here today, Lord. We pray today that you would open our hearts and that you would open our minds so that we could focus on the message and receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
My name is Joe Cade. I'm the pastor here. We're so grateful that you joined us today. I saw on the news that a couple of churches, several churches were closing at nine. I know you're more rugged than that. I know you're rugged people. You want to come up here? I appreciate you getting out in the cold and getting up here. Um, we sent out an email this morning and put it on Facebook, the conditions. If we have much scarier conditions in uh, the coming season, uh, we've signed up with Fox 21 and I believe in the in, NBC, so you can watch either one of those. But you can also get an email from our church if you don't currently get routine emails on Tuesday and Thursday. If you didn't get one this morning, uh, you just need to write us and ask for your email to be added. Uh, you can write leslie at memorialgreer.com and say, please add this email. We'd like to frame our announcements in the five practices of fruitful congregations, the first of which is radical hospitality. We try our very best to have a space that's um, welcoming and inviting to you before you get here. Um, we try our best to have the website updated, um, have all sorts of information there. So if you miss worship for um, family travel, whatever it may be, uh, we try to have everything that we do on YouTube. Uh, SundayScripturePodcast.com has a podcast I do and also the sermon every Sunday. Uh, so we hope that you'll go to those things. We have uh, visitor cards and prayer cards. If you'd like a prayer card that uh, will be shared with our Tuesday prayer group, if you'll raise your hand, an usher will bring you one and uh, it will be shared with the Tuesday prayer group and um, also the church staff. Anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can uh, call a number on the front of your bulletin. Pastoral Caroline, you get an immediate voicemail. That voicemail turns into an email to our church staff. And if you have an immediate concern, just tell us, and we'll respond as quickly as possible. If you have a prayer concern, simply that, tell us, and we'll share it with our Tuesday prayer group and be happy to pray for you. We believe in passionate worship. Um, we appreciate all who order poinsettias this season. We have several up here. We have several in the traditional space. Uh, we ask that you please take your poinsettia home today and enjoy it during the season. Uh, 
If you choose to leave it here, we'll continue to use them during services. And whenever you take your plant, if you'll please leave the tray that's under it. That's more, I think, about traditional worship. They have trays under them because uh, they water them and it protects what it's on. Uh, chapel for K-5 through 2nd graders is today. If you want to go, you can be dismissed with Miss Aaron at this time. Uh, there is no 3rd and 5th grade chapel this month due to Christmas Eve. So if older children want to join today's chapel as helpers, uh, they're welcome to do so. Just follow Miss Aaron uh, right out the door. Um, we have Advent at Home devotions. We've had them this season. The most complicated part of that is we have different um, Advent seasons, A, B, and C. We have different companies that come up with different versions. And so the original one we did didn't exactly line up with what we were doing with worship. It's close. Um, there's a week a one way and a week another way. Um, but if you would like one that is perfectly aligned with what we're doing, uh, you can have those there in the back. We believe in intentional faith development. Uh, we do have Sunday night programming tonight with children and youth. Uh, the youth have a progressive dinner going to a bunch of uh, people's homes on the, on the bus. We're grateful for the people who are helping with the youth program hosting. And we'll just tell you that this is the end of uh, programming for the year. And we'll be back in January. Uh, we believe in risk-taking mission and service. You'll see in the bulletin, you'll actually see all of these announcements, all these headlines in the bulletin. Um, but the, um, You'll see a code drive. I bet every single one of you has got a good coat that you don't use, a good coat that you don't use. If you'll bring that here, whatever size, and we'll make sure that people that need that coat during this season will get it. We believe in extravagant generosity. And um, you'll see as uh, you can give as the plate goes by today, you can give online uh, with directions in the bulletin. You can rely on the generosity of our people. Our people are extremely generous. If you're new here, uh, you can certainly make that decision and, and learn what we're all about. Um, but we also have a volunteer survey. Um, printed copies are in the back. Um, this is things that you're interested in doing in the next couple of years. The digital version of that goes out in every email. Uh, if you'll take... Uh, pretty much five minutes um, to fill it out. We'll make sure you get in a position uh, that suits you, a uh, place that you want to be. Uh, so those are our announcements. Please take your bulletin home with you. We put a great deal of time into it um, so that it can be a perfect resource for you uh, throughout this season. It's now time to uh, light our second Advent candle, and the Duncans are going to help us do that. There's a um, liturgy on your screen, so if you'll follow along when you see bold, if you'll join them with that. morning. Psalm 85, 8 through 10. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Can you hear it? God's word is coming. A voice cries out and declares the promise of peace. The th things are going to even out in the world. Today we light the candle of peace. Peace comes from God. We're going to start off today with an image. Speaking of peace, serenity, mountains, sparse trees. Oh, nope. We're going to start today with morning prayer. <laughs> And jump the gun. Let us pray. Gracious God, calm us down. Slow us down. 
in this season that churns so fast. Allow us space. Call us to that space that we can ponder, reflect, respond. Bless us in this service, Lord, in this space of peace, in this opportunity that we have to hear your word for us this day. Use every element in this service, every image in this service, to declare your message for us. It's in your Son's holy name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, that we've prayed in a way that, um, you know, that really captures it for me. Does that capture it for you? You're jumping ahead. You want to get to the next thing. You have something on your mind and you miss the prayer. That really, really captures it for me. That's the perfect image. And one of the easiest ways to do that, to find a time for prayer, is to find a time for space. Mountains, sparse trees, desert. Is this image comforting to you? Is it not comforting to you because there's so little in it? Is it interesting to you? Is it not interesting to you because there's so little in it? Whatever it may be, we're going to look at this image um, both now and at the end of the sermon with a couple of ideas in mind. This is a place we visit, not a place we stay. It's a place we stand in awe and we look off before we go to the next place that we're going to see. We love the open air. We love the lack of clutter when we see this image. But after we visit this place, after a suitable amount of time, we go home because there's no Wi-Fi in this place. There's no restrooms in this place. There's no television in this place. There's no couches or chairs or beds or shelter in this place. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written in the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I'm sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. So your first phrase is the wilderness. The wilderness has two images completely separated by centuries. One, a prophet in the Old Testament trying to figure out what are we to do. And he's out in the wilderness declaring, shouting, that clarity is coming. That a new message is coming, that hope is coming. To whom? Who's out there? Not very many people. How many people you run out, run into in a space like that? And now, the Gospel of Mark starts with the image of that prophecy centuries before someone's going out in the desert. Someone who truly understands, someone is going to declare the way and shout it way out in the desert. Now, if I said these three words about this text... Would you identify with them in this season? Shouting, preparing, straightening. These are things that we do a lot in this season. We have more people over. We go over to more people's house. We have more pressure because of the people who are coming over, whether they be friends, whether they be relatives. And we go around and this chair isn't good enough. Now it's good enough. This thing isn't good enough. Now we straighten it up. This thing was clean yesterday. Now it's a crazy mess today. Now we've got to make it clean again before these people come over. Here's a thing that we didn't even notice when people were uh, about to come in the door. 
shouting, preparing, and straightening. It's found in this text, it's found in Isaiah, and it's found, even if you took the Bible completely out of our lives, it's found in this season for us. And this messenger says, we have got to shout a message of hope. Now, how often do you do that? How often, when it gets escalated enough that you are shouting, is it a message of hope? Not very often. Normally, shouting is the last possible option. And in a season when you might be more busy than most, on roads that might be more cluttered than most, in stores that might have longer lines than most, your patience drops. And shouting might be your first resort. But this guy, if we bring the Bible into it, into this season, is shouting a message of hope. He's preparing a way, both literally and figuratively, for someone to come who's going to show us this is what we're going to do. Doesn't that give you a sense of peace? You think about an element in your life when you don't understand how to do it. Whether it's cooking something in the kitchen, whether it's changing something on your cell phone, whether it's balancing some sort of financial books, whatever it is you think, man, I hope somebody comes because I don't know what I'm doing. And a person comes into that space and knows exactly what they're doing. Shouting and preparing for someone to come into this space so that we can understand, so that we can hope. Verse 4. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. So your next phrase is the Jordan River. He said people are changing out there. There might be several things you might change about yourself if you had the power to have a magic wand. They might not have anything to do with faith or religion or church or following Jesus. If you were to hone down something that you could truly change about your life in relation to God, what would that thing be? And see, if we had bubbles over our heads, how many do you think would be aligned? Just one thing. How many do you think would be different? I'd say we'd have a fair chance that as many people are in here are as many differences as we would have. Do you think that's any different than those people that are gathered in this space around the Jordan River? Mm -mm. No, they don't have cars. They don't have cell phones. They don't have the same jobs that we do. They don't have the same concerns that we do in this age. But they sure are human. They sure are in relationships. They sure have found something about the temple empty. Something about the existing religion empty. Or they might have found something in that existing religion, but they want to go much deeper. They found it to be on the surface level. Haven't you felt that way in church before? Haven't you wondered on Sunday morning whether you were going to come or not based on whether it was going to be surface level or based on whether you felt a certain way about it? Hasn't it felt like an obligation before? I'll give you a hint. There's times when people who are paid to be here <laughs> professionally have an empty feeling, feel like it's shallow, feel like it's not the thing that's going to help them. There are definitely people at this river who find meaning and hope in the temple. But there's definitely people who do not. And that's why they're there. And these people at this river, it says, are changing. What's a big way that they're changing? They're forgiving. And we've talked about that. How many times have you heard about forgiveness? from your family members, 
from your minister, from your Sunday school teacher, from your peers? How many times have you heard about forgiveness and they say, hey, if you don't forgive, you're holding the whole weight. You just need to forgive. You need to forgive. You need to forgive. Okay, I asked you to think about the one thing that you would change in the life of the church and in your connection to it. What's the one thing that's truly, truly hard to forgive? Does it pop up like that? Or are there three things fighting for it? Three things fighting to be that number one thing. He says they are changing out there in the wilderness. They're forgiving each other out there in the wilderness. You know, there's a certain bonding aspect to that. I've had relatives, I've had friends, I've had college classmates go through the 12-step program. And when they are acknowledging the true brokenness that they were not willing to tackle, that then led them to want to numb whatever it was, that then led them to whatever it was that had control of their life, so many times it goes back to forgiveness and pain. And so many times that forgiveness is not with another person. It's with the things that you feel inside yourself that you cannot let go. Uh, I think it's... I forget. Sundays go by so fast. It was in 11 o'clock, either last week or the week before. I referenced to a brother. I, I referenced to a brother all the time. And actually said, that don't make no sense. I mean, we said, that don't make no sense. Remember when they were in the river? Remember when he said he was forgiven? He said, he forgave everything. And he said, well, you know, what about that A&P that you knocked off? And he said, well, yep, he forgave that too. That feeling of release... That feeling of hope, that feeling of purpose can only come from forgiveness. And it can only come in the way that you forgive yourself for being a broken human being that you've been all along. All along. And down by this river, people are changing. Down by this river, people are forgiving and how far is it from the temple? It's a long, long way. It is a long way from the temple, especially if you're walking. These people are walking. And if we think that this service naturally inclines people to not think that worship can only happen in one space, because we turn this basketball, preschool, dinner, whatever space into a worship space all the time but if we get the sense that worship can happen in a space if we get the sense that forgiveness can happen in a space if we get the sense that we travel to a space and do things in a loving helpful way and then we leave that right where it is and then we go on to life everywhere we're going this text tells us it's the exact opposite of that it's down by the river out in the wilderness that people are changing, forgiving, and blessing one another. Verse 6. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if you go back one, what's funny, like if y'all wrote this, if someone was writing down what I did as a minister, they'd be like, he wore a blue Oxford and khakis every Sunday. And not like multiple blue Oxfords and khakis, like the same, the exact same blue Oxford and khakis and shoes every single Sunday until they wore down to nothing and then he went and bought the exact same blue Oxford and khakis. He said, is this tied to him being rugged out in the wilderness? Is this tied um, to former prophets? Is this tied to um, uh, getting as completely far away from the city as whatever you possibly can? I think yes. All of the above. 
this guy is drawing people out and saying it's going to be different. It's going to be different. And the most important way that it's going to be different than they've ever seen before is the guy who's drawing them out there is saying, I'm not the important one here. That's so hard. That's so hard when crowd gets, crowds get bigger. It's so hard when the account grows larger that you're responsible for. It's so hard when the grades get better in whatever classroom that you're teaching to not go. Yep. We all think of that. He says, someone more important than me is coming. You know how fragile that is to say to people that I'm not the one? No, we, no, we came out here to hear you. You're the interesting one. I'm not, I don't know who else is coming. I want to talk to you. I'll give you the um, perfect image of uh, things that I say and do all the time here when people are interested in joining our church. And I've said it in every church that I've ever been in. People are um, at that fragile state of saying, I think this is the church family for us. And in that moment, I could say to them, like a college football coach talking to a recruit, I'll be here your entire time. I'll be here the entire step of every step of the way. But in that fragile moment of when people are considering whether to stay in this church, whether to join this church, I tell them, well, let me, let me make sure you understand something. In the United Methodist Church, and then I lay out the, what, the reasons why we move, and um, I usually use the NFL, and if the commissioner said the Patriots are great, and they take the defensive coordinator from the Patriots, they give them to the, uh, uh, who's terrible this year? I don't, I don't even know. Jacksonville? Except they're good this year. Uh, whoever it is. We're going to take this person to the Browns. We're going to take the entire coaching staff of New England. We're going to give them to the Browns because merciful. And in that moment, they say, they say, what? I say, I want you to fall in love with this church. I want you to fall in love with what's happening on this campus. Do not fall in love with me because I don't know the nature of what's going to happen with me. And then they want to know exactly how that works. And then I lay it out. He says, this movement is not going to be fixed to a person, nor is it going to be fixed to a location. This movement is light and lean and anywhere with anyone. It's significant to point that out. But your next phrase is the silence. Now you hear different um, reports on this, different numbers on this, but the suggestion is 400 years since a prophet has spoken. 400 years. And now a prophet is out in the wilderness. You know what's happened in that silence? Conquering armies, terrible emperors, forgotten promises on the part of the people, and centuries without any voice, any clarity, any hope. You can look, everybody look up there and wave. See? If kids get a sense that a place is friendly, forget it. And they, are, they have that sense here. This place is friendly. Thank y'all. Conquering armies, burning everything down, terrible, terrible emperors taking as, many, as much as they want of anything that they have, forgotten promises of people who said, yes, I will remain true to you. Well, I didn't know it was going to be this hard. I'm out. And no voice. 400 years. Let's look at the picture again. It's in a place like this that multiple people in the Bible are called to a completely new thing. It's only in a place like this where they can hear anything whatsoever. I've been in those inner walkways in the inner city of Jerusalem. You're not going to hear anything any more than you're going to hear anything in downtown Atlanta, downtown New York. If you made, uh, if, if you got Charleston and the market and you shrunk it down with the same number of people, the same number of things, shrunk it down just this tight, that's how it would feel. Not hear anything in there. 
It's only out in this space. It's only out in this space where you can get peace that you can hear anything whatsoever. Now, uh, every Friday morning, it's not, it doesn't look like this, but every Friday morning I go out 101 in my truck with my dog. We ride all the way up to past 11. We ride over to 14 and we come down 14. Just to clear. Just to have peace. Just to see the mountains. So we do have something similar that close. Are there any practices that you have that give you space in this season? If you don't do that, there won't be a voice. And it's not that the voice isn't there. It's not that the truth isn't there, the hope isn't there. It's that you have drowned it out with every other thing that you're doing. And guess what I get it? I get being in motion. I get having headphones in and listening to something as I'm doing something, as I'm watching something. I get it. But I'm telling you, it's significant, significant to break that space. Your last phrase. Breaking the silence. This is the start of this season. In the Gospel of Mark, there is no story of a baby. There is no Mary and Joseph. There's John the Baptist out in the desert saying something is coming. He says a voice is breaking through. A promise that truth is once again coming. And there is no temple. What does that mean for you? That means that the truth might not be breaking through for you when you come on this campus. What do we ask you to do when you come on this campus? Go look at the volunteer sheet. It's like 25 pages long, front and back. There's a hundred things that we ask you to do as you come on this campus. Uh, hundreds of things that we ask you to read. All kinds of things that we ask you to do when you're here. This may not be the moment. And if you rely completely on this moment to be the only way that you're ever going to hear the voice, you might not hear it. When the voice is being declared outside the temple, out in open space, that means you've got to find open space. No excuses. What does that mean to me as the pastor of a church? The gravitational pull for the pastor to the campus is stronger than anything you could, can, you could think of. All kinds of stuff to keep me here thinking about things that are here. This text tells me I've got to be away from it. Not away from it like at the beach watching uh, the tide. Away from it reaching people. Away from it, offering opportunities to listen, to hear, to speak. This text means that I've got to be obsessed with people who are not particularly interested in coming to the temple. And that means that we're going to put our heart into that. For two years, I've focused on this campus. And rightly so, I think. Rightly so, I think. With the staff that we've had, with the facility stuff that we've had, with the changeover that we've had, with the development of things that we're doing on this campus. But this text calls us away. So when you see that picture and you think to yourself, well, I'm not going to find a desert. Not asking you to. But I'm asking you to find a space away from the clutter and the noise in order to hear and heed the voice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand and join me with our modern affirmation. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, 
Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope and the promise of God fulfilled. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, reminding us always of the truth of Christ, our inspiration and strength in times of joy and sorrow. We believe our faith should be apparent in our words of love and acts of service, that the kingdom of God may be a present reality here on earth. You may be seated. It's now time for our offering. I want to say thank you to the people who have pledged all year long and fulfilled their pledge. We're so grateful with the amazing percentage uh, that we have. We're grateful for the people who haven't pledged, who's joined us since that season throughout this year. Our unpledged giving uh, is beyond anything that we're accustomed to. We're grateful for that. If you would like to give as the plate goes by, you certainly can. If you would like to give online, you can. If you would like to rely on the generosity of our people, please do. They're very generous. Give the sign. 
would you stand and sing this last one with us?
Christmas Eve will be 10 a.m. in this space, 5.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. I encourage you to come to both. They'll be entirely different. You can have your pajamas here. We'll have donuts and coffee and orange juice. Technically, you could have your pajamas over there. Uh, I don't know if you'll, you'll, you might feel a little weird over there in your pajamas. But I encourage you to come to both. Um, they'll both be very special. Absolutely come to one. And if you're out of town, watch them on YouTube. They'll be significant. Go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you all.